kicking off our summer series tonight. Um, my sister called me today and she goes, Kara, I heard you're speaking, congratulations. It's the new theme, right? Seriously, seriously, seriously. And I said, oh, no, just called seriously. Taking Jesus said his word and we're kicking it off tonight and I am so excited. Um, so I first wanted to talk to you guys. I got a fun story for you guys. I think you're gonna like this one. So when I was little, I, let's just say I was constantly ending up on the ground somehow. I had like zero, we're gonna say balance for a better, use of a better word. I would fall down all the time and I would always, mom, I got hurt, mom, I got hurt. And she would walk it off with her like it's not a serious injury. You're fine. And then I started doing Taekwondo and I got better. I got a little bit better at balance and stuff. That's something that they teach you there. And then one time I was playing one of my brother's football practices and I fall down and I hurt my wrist and I go, mom, I think it's broken. And she goes, Kara, you're fine. It's not that serious. And I go, no, 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 like it really hurts. I think I need to go to the hospital. And she goes, Kara, you know what? You know what? Here is two options. We can either go to the hospital or you can miss your pool birthday party tonight at your friend's house. My brother and my sister were going, all our friends were going. So she's like, she's going to fall for this one. She's going to go to the pool party. It's not going to be big. And I go, no, I need to go to the hospital. And my wrist was broken. <laughs> so that taught them to take me a little bit more serious. <laughs> so, so we're talking all about taking Jesus seriously this summer. And what does that even mean? That what does it mean to take Jesus seriously? And when we look in scripture, a lot of the times, people were like trying to trap Jesus. A lot of the times they were saying like, no, that doesn't make any sense. They were living in a world, much like ours today, where we praise having riches, and we praise those people who we think, we say, they are just so blessed. They are so blessed, they got the big house, they have all those cars, they have all the brand new iPhones, all the technology, they are just so blessed. And when... They said that that's the type of person that you need to be, that's the way that you should live, and that's a lot like how we're living today. But taking Jesus seriously says the other thing. Jesus says, oh, you, you, the world's saying be rich, I'm saying come be my servant. And so taking Jesus seriously means going against the social normalities of this world and living a life more like Jesus. And I feel like that's a term that we often use. A lot of times you'll see the preacher standing up on stage saying, live a life more like Jesus. You always say, okay, so what do I do? What do I do to live a life more like Jesus? So they go, okay, go read scripture more. So you go read scripture more. And then they're saying, you know what, that wasn't enough. What do I do? Okay, pray more. Okay, so you pray more. That was not enough. Go on a mission trip. And you just keep asking, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Because as humans, we love the, the quick fix. The, okay, this is my answer to live a life more like Jesus. When in reality, Jesus has told us that it's not about what we do, it's about our hearts. It's about who we are. And we don't like that because we're the, we're the, we like the quick fix. We hate looking on the inside and figuring out what's gonna change. Because to do takes a simple action, while to be takes a transformation. And that is all what we're talking about tonight. Taking Jesus seriously, and looking at how to transform our hearts. And now we, we, we talked about this last week. We're basing our summer series off the Sermon on the Mount. And we read through all of that last week. And if you guys haven't read it yet, I highly encourage you. It's Matthew 5 through 7. Go read it. But tonight, we're focusing mainly on Matthew 5, 3 through 12. It's called the Beatitudes. And I want to ask you guys to open up your Bibles. If you bring your Bibles, if you have your phone, I'm going to let you open it. Just go the Bible up, please. So we're open up to Matthew 5. It's going to be verses 3 through 12. So I'm going to read that to you guys now. I can find it. Um, it didn't work. Okay. It says, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the full earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing what is right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad, for the great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. And so that is called the Beatitudes. 
if you have not yet seen it, there's a little title at the top, so it's the Beatitudes. And I, I've always, whenever I read that, whenever I heard a sermon about it, I like instantly was like out. I was like, okay, Beatitudes, we're done. Like, I don't know what that means. I'm just going to kind of ignore it. And you know what? It was kind of, it was kind of depressing to read. I'm not going to lie to you, because if we look at these first couple verses, God bless those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, and they will be comforted. Because when you read that, your first instinct is to think, who would ever want a life like that? Who would want a life constantly in like mourning, constantly upset about something? Somebody who's poor, we always talk about the, the, the word poor, your first instinct is going having no money. But the thing about that is, the Beatitudes is a description, not a prescription for life. Jesus does not say, you can't be rich and be my servant. You can't do all these things and you can't be happy. You, you don't have to be poor. But he is rather saying, when you are poor, when you are mourning, that is when you are blessed. And you know, we often think about like, I, I have felt, I have felt that. I've been mourning, I've lost a, a grandparent, a parent, even just a pet, a friend moved away. And that was upsetting. I did not feel blessed then. And I get it. I get it. it it's, it's hard to, to feel blessed because you, you think that when you, when you hear God's blessing, that it's going to be God's going to make me just happy again. I'm going to be happy when God says I am blessed. He says that I am happy. But rather, that is not what God says. God says you will be comforted. I can go back to that camera. Yeah. Oh, no. But it says, God, you will be comforted. You will find favor with God. He will look at you and he, you will find favor with him. He doesn't promise you happiness, but rather comfort and peace. So going back to the, we're going to go next. Is, so God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And that is just what one translation says. A lot of the other ones say poor in spirit. So because I feel like when we often we read, blessed are those who are poor, we think immediately the riches, and, you, that, and we live in a county, we live in a society where there's not, we are very fortunate. We are very well off, we, we have cars, everybody in here probably got a phone or a tablet or something. And so you, you read that and you go, I don't really want to be poor, that's not the life that I want. I would like to succeed, I would like to make money. I am going into a profession where I would likely make a lot of money. Engineering, man, that's the path to go down. Um, <laughs> but so, when you translate it, it says poor in spirit. And I think I've heard enough messages from Kristen Milligan where I looked at this and then I decided that I could not, I was not okay with that. And I had to translate it in Hebrew. And I did not put, I'm not going to put the Hebrew stuff up there just because I don't know how to pronounce it and I don't want to botch for that. And, but, so when you translate poor into Hebrew and then back to English one more time, it actually comes out as blessed are those who are miserable in spirit. It's not poor, but rather miserable. And then again, it comes back to who would ever want a life, that paper's gone, um, who would ever want to live a life like that? Why would we ever want to be miserable? Why would we ever want to mourn? Because I, I guarantee you that we have all felt that at some point, like, I don't want that for my life. I want to be happy. I've been told, you know, following Jesus is going to make me happy. But still, God says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are miserable in spirit for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And I feel like that's because it comes down to this. Those who feel the most broken have the most to gain. I read this book from, let's get Kristen Milligan coming in for this message. Kristen Milligan made this book called The End of Me by Kyle Eidelman. And it's all about how when you come to the end of yourself, your own selfish desires, that's when you meet God and you start chasing after him. So when we are the most broken, when we finally come to the end of ourselves and we go, can't do it anymore, I don't have the power anymore, that's when you have the most to gain from Jesus. So when you look at it, the prideful, the people who think I can do it all by myself, they're not searching after Jesus. And that's what we're called to, we're called to desire. Broken's a strong word, so I, I I feel like we often in the world they say, oh, they are just so broken. They're so broken. They 
they, they've had so much going on in their lives. And I feel like a lot of us, we sit there and we go, we haven't had that big of a thing go on in my life. I haven't had like this big tragic event happen before. But type it into Google, it also means defeated, overwhelmed, and overpowered. How many of you guys have felt overwhelmed during a test? Before a test? Before a sports game? Defeated after a game? That stinks. So we look at this and it's everybody has felt that before. I'll tell you guys a little personal story. I have felt broken before. I have felt very down. Just a couple of months ago, I was at a point where I said, I just like, I don't know anymore, like the pain, it hurts, and my friend said, Kara, this is when Jesus works the best. This is when you feel like you are shattered into pieces. When you feel the most broken, that is when Jesus comes in and says, I got you. You are mine. And if, even if you don't believe me, even if you don't think, oh, Kara, you're just saying that, like, we're sitting in a church building, and you're standing up, you were told to give a message, and so you came up with a story. It's also in here, multiple times. And we believe that this, this is the truth. So if we, and I'm going to show you guys a passage from the Psalms. A lot of times we get a lot of our, our worship music from the Psalms, and we see that the Psalms are what like encourage us. It's, praise God, we're always going to be singing, that's wonderful. But David, King David, also wrote a lot of the Psalms, and there's a lot of them that are about lament. Lament, mourning grieving, brokenness, pain. Psalms 10, 1 through 4 says, Why, Lord, do you stand so far off? Why do you hide yourselves in times of trouble? In his arrogance, the wicked man hunts down the weak who are caught in the schemes and devices. He boasts about the cravings of his heart. He blesses the greedy and reviles in the Lord. In his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. In all of his thoughts, there are no room for God. Do you just like imagine that real quick? In his thoughts there are no room for God. In other translations it says in his thoughts God is dead. And that is just not the truth. So I don't think I said David wrote a lot of these. And we learn from scripture that David is the only man in the Bible who is called a man after God's own heart. The only person. And yet still he's standing here saying, Lord, where are you? Lord, where are you? He has felt that brokenness. He has felt that pain. And, and yet he's still called a man after God's own heart. What, what even is a man after God's own heart? And once again, that goes back to being at the end of our selfish desires and chasing after God. Being after God's heart is all about, God, what do you want? What can I do for you? It, it's the consistently trying to be with God, to be like Jesus. And David even in his pain, even in his brokenness, even in his mess-ups, is called a man after God's own heart. And that is because just a few verses later, he says, You, Lord, hear the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them and you listen to their cry, defending the fatherless and the oppressed so that mere earthly mortals will never again strike terror. God blesses those who are poor. God blesses those who are miserable in spirit. David, at his worst, still calls upon the Lord and says, Lord, where are you? I know that you've got this, though. And I feel like a lot of the times we think, I don't know how people do that. I've thought that before. I've thought that. I'm like, I don't know how people can just sit there and say, God's got it. Because I, I know I struggle with that. But yet, at that time, God says, at that moment, when you are at your worst, when you are hurting, when you are broken, when you feel anxious, when you feel depressed, are those terms starting to sound a little bit more familiar? That's a lot of stuff that we, we, we had a series last year called The Search. We talked all about that stuff. Now, at that moment, that is when Jesus calls upon you and says, I can help. Come after me. Because when we are miserable in our spirit, that's when we realize our need for him. Because you need Jesus, guys. Let me tell you, you cannot do this life on your own. You cannot. I'm sure that there's been a time that you've tried, or maybe you're trying right now. You're saying, no, I got it. I don't need him. 
I promise you, you do. Because there's going to be a point where you feel overwhelmed, overpowered, defeated, utterly broken, <coughs> and hopeless. <coughs> and that's when you need to realize your need for him. Jesus doesn't promise happiness. There are going to be days where you're going to be at your absolute high, and it is the best day ever, and the next day you cannot believe that that day ever happened because it just hurts so bad. Those days happen. Those weeks happen. And that's when we realize our need for him. Because the kingdom of heaven is ours when we realize our need for him. We will be comforted when we realize our need for him. It, it, it's hard to think about. I get it. It's hard to think about. It's, it's like, Carol, I'm feeling the brokenness right now. I feel the pain right now. Go to God because he keeps his promises. I promise you. <laughs> See what I did <laughs> Uh, like we, I talked to a couple weeks ago when we were up here on stage talking about our friends. God keeps his promises. He has never once made a promise that he doesn't keep. Because we are his children. And if we realize our need for him, we will be comforted. And so, it's at that moment, like I talked about, it says, it's at the end of ourselves. It's at that end of me moment. When you realize, I cannot do it anymore. I need Jesus. That he's going to start working on your heart. That he's going to start saying, you know, okay, you're going to give yourself to me now, and I'm going to work on you. It's this summer we talk, we're talking about seriously taking Jesus better at his word, and we're going to be talking all about how we can take him literally more seriously so that we can go out into the world. The world does not really love Christians right now because we say so many things and then we don't go do it. And so we decided that we're going to talk this summer all about what to do, but before you can figure out what to do, you have to figure out who to be. And that's all about the transformation initially of your heart. When we take Jesus seriously, we will be transformed into men and women after God's own heart. And that's what we want to be. Jesus says, come and desire me. And I'm not saying it's just fix your heart and you'll be good. In James it says, faith without action is dead. But action without faith, that doesn't work either. In Matthew 23, flip there if you want as well. In Matthew 23, verse 3, it says, So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but do not follow their example, for they don't practice what they teach. They crush people with their unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to see them. Everything they do is for show. Before you go out and you take that action, before you say, I want to live like Jesus, first you have to let Jesus transform your heart. First you have to let him work on your heart so that you desire every step. So that you desire is for to further his kingdom with glory only to him. In a minute we're going to go to small groups and we're going to talk about a couple things. And I feel like this, it, it's a very internal thing, and that can kind of be a real struggle sometimes. You don't want to, it, it's hard to look and figure out, okay, like, what, what is she saying? What do I need to figure out? And that's hard. And so we're going to talk a lot about what do you need to do to let God transform in your spirit? Or what do you need to let God transform in your spirit? And when Rocky and I were talking about this, he's like, Carrie, you need to be able to answer that question. And I was like, oh, shoot, you're right. <laughs> what you need to let God transform your spirit. So I told him, I said, I'm going to college in a couple of months, and that's hard for me, because I do not trust what's in the future. That is terrifying to me. But if I let him transform that, I will find comfort. If I let him transform that, I will realize my need for him. This week, we're going to AIM. I know a lot of you guys have signed up for that. And that is, that is not Forsyth County. There are people living very differently than what we are used to. So maybe you need to let God transform the way that you think about them, the way you think about your living situations. Because when we let him transform our hearts, when we take Jesus seriously and realize his blessing, we will be transformed. All right, so we're gonna go to small group in a couple minutes and I really want you guys to think about this question. If you don't mind, I'm going to pray this out and then we can to this. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for letting us be here tonight. Thank you for letting us come and worship you, Lord. 
with our whole hearts. God, we ask that you help us realize what we need to be transformed, what you need to be working on in our hearts. Lord, let us be open to it, and we praise you, Lord. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.